ಭೌಮಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮರನ್ನಸ್ಯಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನಾಶಲಾಖಾ ಚಕ್ಷೂರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೀಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ಜಗನ್ನಾಥ್ ಪುರಿ because wherever your mind and heart is that's where you are and it doesn't matter where you live in the material world if you're um absorbed in the in the mellows of kirtan the, the the sound vibration takes you to the sacred place because the the holy name is the best of all personalities and is the most merciful and can take us by the hand out of the material world at any time we can be extracted just by chanting the holy name that's how kind krishna is that he comes in the form of his holy name and anyone can drink water like out of the palm of their hands by by chanting and there we were just transported back to jagannath puri and all of us because of contributing to the spiritual process throughout this lifetime when we leave this world we will also very easily be able to transport ourselves to that memory of our connection with the holy dam the holy name with our services krishna will help us and from there according to krishna in the bhagavad gita one is uh, transferred into krishna's existence so by dint of being transferred even in this lifetime so the chanting the holy name must go on always the devotees in their homes or offices or wherever they are they're always itching to grab the beat bag and uh, continue chanting even when they don't feel like chanting they have an urge to chant because they know they should chant and when they have a taste to chant they grab the bag and they keep chanting but this is the admonition given by the acharyas and that is keep the holy name going all the time because if all else fails and it will you should chant hari krishna and uh, that's the only thing that actually works in kali yuga so if you're disappointed because everything's broken and nothing works properly and people mistreat you including your own kith and kin don't worry that's the way it is especially in kali yuga but always in the material world but the holy name always works the holy name is always there and the holy name always shows up whenever we chant and i thank everyone for joining us here today at this kind of silicon valley both here in the studio audience and those who have joined us from places online how's the temperature in here it's too warm it's like the sahara desert in here if someone could turn it down by one or two clicks we be eternally grateful ho magyana timirandasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshuram mudhandena tasmay shri gurave namaha so now shri got to prabhu will tell us the meaning of this uh shloka we just chanted together if you'll kindly hand him the microphone expand turn up his mic please from is He's opened my eyes and relieved me from ignorance. With Hold that right in front of your mouth, please. Uh, he's he's opened my uh, I pay my obeisances to my spiritual master, who has opened my eyes and relieved me from ignorance uh, through the torchlight of knowledge. Can you give a little bit of an exposition of what ignorance is? Where does ignorance come from? Uh, ignorance is when you don't know, not when someone doesn't know their relationship with Krishna. and that is um the guru they have hel- helps get rid of that because uh guru educates their disciple on uh their relationship with krishna how they could serve krishna in a better way can you give us some shastra to back up any of those things uh someone can help him by uh, grabbing a shloka book and giving it to him let's see who wins uh, navina <laughs> if you were to fi- look for some uh evidence in that shloka book how would you go about it if you didn't if your mind didn't go right to a verse just now 
just tell us the process. Process is more important than knowing something. Knowing the process is more important. Uh, I probably, I probably go to the index and then. Here's an educated devotee. <laughs> go to the index, yeah. And what would you look under? Uh, in the index, I'd look for. Uh, I'd probably look for something like relationship with Krishna or uh, Guru or. Okay. Or you go look. ahead. You look it up and find us some evidence to back up what you're saying. Because okay. what you're saying is very, very good. And if you added on a little bit of Shastric evidence, then. Practically, we'd be we'd blow the roof off of this temple to so bring it to such a high level. That's how important it is to back up whatever you say with some shastra. Even if it's very simple, then your words are infinitely more meaningful because you can say where it came from. What you said was excellent. Om Jnana Timurandasya Jnana Jana Shavakaya Chakshurun Militandina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupa Kadahmayam Dadati Swapadantika When you should tell us what this verse means. What is it called? Um, this is the Shri Rupa Pranam. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it talks about um, we're paying respects to uh, Shri Rupa Goswami. Don't ever start with it, I think, because uh, then it, it weakens the whole sentence. Um, if you want to say something wrong, go down in flames and just say it. Right. Okay, go ahead. Um, in this verse, it talks about um, paying respects or obeisances to Shri Rupa Goswami. Um, because he established this, um, like, scriptures, I think, uh, scriptures, <laughs> and um, it talks about uh, um, falling on to his lotus feet. I'm not sure. So no, no, don't say I'm not sure. Okay. Just stop at the end. Yeah. You don't have to add on, um, ex you know, like, I'm not going to say this very well, or anything. just leave that out. So very good, excellent. Uh, let's talk about Manobhishtam. Does anybody have an idea what that means? Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam. First of all, who's Shri Chaitanya? Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is who? Um, Krishna. Use the mic. Krishna himself. How, how do you know? Shastra. Um. Call a friend. Prabhu has his computer back there. He'll help you with anything. You would just ask him. He'll relay a verse to you. Uh, go, you go get it. Anshu, go get it. No, 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 sit down. Give him the mic. Go. So if you don't know something, just ask the right person. He'll tell you. He'll give you a verse. Sorry, I had to work, so... <laughs> Krishna Varnam Tisa Krishnam Sangha Pangastra Parshadam Yagnai Sankirtana Praya Jajantehi Sumedasha Okay. 11th Canto um, Text 32, 5th Chapter I think. Okay, does your boss know you're here? <laughs> <laughs> we don't put the camera on him. Hopefully they won't recognize his voice. Good. Look what Avantika is doing. She's getting the shloka books. So now look that verse up, and then you can get back to us. So good to back it up. And this Mano Bhishtam means that uh, what is in the mind of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is why Rupa Goswami, uh, we are called Rupa Anugas. What does that mean, Rupa Anuga? Who can say? So what does Anuga mean? Yes, and Rupa Anuga means? Yeah, we're followers of Rupa Goswami. So Rupa Goswami, Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam, he knows the mind and heart of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is his qualification. He's such an intimate associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He understands what his purpose is, what his inner intention, his feelings, everything. So we're following such a person. and. At all times in devotional service, we're followers. And this is the secret to success. If one follows in the footsteps of the great devotees, 
Bejure Munio Tagre Bhagavantam Madhuksajam Satvam Vishuram Shemaya Kalpante Yenutaniha. Srimad Bhagavatam says that the great souls have followed the process of worshipping Lord Vishnu and anyone who follows in their footsteps, they also become eligible for the same result as the great souls got. So we become servants of the servants of the servants in the sense that we serve their order and we serve their mood and method. And we know Rupa Goswami to be the Mano Bhishtam, the one who knows the mind of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Does anybody know, can recite a pastime from the Chaitanya Charitamrita in which this is revealed most um, profoundly how it is that we know that Rupa Goswami knows the mind of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And luckily, Naveena Narada Prabhu, who is the first Bhaktivedanta recipient, well, had just walked in the room and can help us with that. <laughs> Please uh, grab the, here, go get the Antya Leela Volume 1 within seven seconds or less, or your money back. He's going to tell us anyway, I can tell. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, Sri Rupa Goswami, he knows the mind of Lord Chaitanya, and this comes out in different places, but the one place I think that you were hinting towards is when he wrote a very particular verse and he had that verse and he put it in the roof of his hut, the straw roof. And when Mahaprabhu came, he, he read that verse and he was very surprised to see how much Rupa Goswami was in touch with his heart and his inner purpose. So you will tell us what exactly that verse This verse is. was a verse that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was speaking during the Ratha Yatra. The Ratha Yatra is a very feeling festival, Prabhupada used to say. And this is a festival of rasa between Radha and Krishna. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes to the Ratha Yatra, he is representing uh, the side of Srimati Radharani, and Krishna is there on the chariot. And she's drawing him back to Vrindavan. And during that festival, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted many verses. In fact, you'll find throughout his Leela that the way in which Mahaprabhu enters deeply within the mood of Vrindavan is to remember verses, or his associates would recite them and invoke these sentiments that would come from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is our process process of advancing in devotional service has to do with the sound vibration. Now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in such ecstasy during the Rathyashra that it's important for us to note the kinds of verses that he was singing. And while he was dancing at Rathyashra, the devotees around him were noticing that he was reciting a verse from what would have been in the modern day sort of like something you'd hear on the radio like some song, some popular song, like a Bollywood song. I don't know any, but I know the dances. <laughs> and, and they were wondering what it was. Why, why was he singing this particular song, that, a popular song of the day? And then, when uh, Rupa Goswami wrote this verse, he was actually, understand, he understood the mind of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, why he was singing that verse. And he put it into the modern... Uh, or into the, the direct context in which he meant that song. And he wrote a parallel verse to glorify the, the relationship between Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then could immediately understand when he found that verse uh, stuck in the uh, thatch of the roof of Rupa Goswami's uh, hut. He had gone off to take a bath in the sea. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu read the verse, he said, Oh, he understands my mind. He knows my heart exactly. And then he had give, given him a mild slap out of love, like, how did you know that? And then in front of all the exalted devotees, like Savabhan Bhattacharya, Ramananda Roy, Surup Damodar, he revealed the glories of Rupa Goswami and said, this is my great devotee. 
they were just getting to meet him at that time. And the devotees there were such exalted souls, actually they're associates of Krishna in the spiritual world in the form of uh, maidservant, manjaris, uh, ser serving his um, personal body or the body, taking care of those who are serving him. And so they have very intimate relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. And all of them in this manifestation, worldly manifestation, are great poets. Or kavis, actually, out of uh, millions of poets, there may be a kavi who is so expert as to be able to express the most uh, sublime and detailed information about the spiritual world through the poetry. This is one of the essential parts of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. But out of millions of poets comes along a great kavi who is able to, for instance, write poetry backwards and forwards and have it mean the same thing either way. And who has all of the um, literary embellishments at, at his command and is able to, to express them. So Rupa Goswami was, a, was such a great learned person and a poet. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was introducing him to all the devotees as such. And they were talking about the quality of his writing and saying that unless uh, a poem uh, makes your head spin, what is its use? In other words, it's meant to take us emotionally to the spiritual world and introduce us to Krishna. Naveena Prabhu, you want to say more about the pastime? So this is, this is one of the times at which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revealed to his associates and to ev everyone in the world the importance of Srila Rupa Goswami. And he had instructed Srila Rupa Goswami then to go forward and reveal to the rest of the world the, the process of Krishna consciousness. And from what song, what modern song that we've sung several times here in this assembly, do we hear about a summary of the way in which Rupa Goswami wrote about Krishna and Vrindavan and the spiritual world and revealed to us all, all of the secrets of bhakti? Hari Harai Nama Krishna? Uh, nope. Not exactly, but th th we can accept that. I'm, the one I'm thinking of is by Srinivasacharya, Shad Goswami Ashtakam. He starts off, Nana Shastra Vichara Naika Nipano. And this uh, says that the Goswamis of Vrindavan, especially Rupa and Sanatan, had uh, revealed the <coughs> essence of all the scriptures. They had gone through them meticulously and then brought out the essence of them all. After all, it's not so easy to enter into the Vedic scriptures as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, Nisraigunya Bhavarjana, Nirdvan Vosa, Nityasattva Sto, Yoga Kshemam Yadatmavan. No, sorry. Tri Yoga. I can't hear from a distance, so I'm just going to say the verse over again. It's Trigunya Vishaya Veda, Nisraigunya Bhavarjana, Nirdvan Vosa, Nityasattva Sto, Nir Yoga Shema Atmavan. So, He's indicating here that there's a way that one should not simply accept the wholesale presentation of the Vedas because uh, much of it, although it's like one tree, is irrelevant to us. It's about the three modes of material nature and how to live happily or more just adjusted life in the material world. But one should know the purpose behind the Vedas. Yavanarta Udapani Sarvata Samplutorike Tavan Sarve Shu Brahmanasya Vijanataha he said, if you know the purpose behind the Vedas, then you can take the benefit from it. In the same way that if you have a flowing river, then you get all the benefit of the tiny little wells that are around town that are used for various purposes. And Rupa Goswami revealed to the world what the meaning of the entire Vedic project is, coming down to very specific points of how one should utilize one's life to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead through the process of Bhakti Yoga. So when we say, what happened to our verses? Although we accept the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as the culmination of all. We were on Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishnam. I'm sorry? Verse number. 
Okay. I'll just go back to Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam. This is how my brain works. Now you see how my brain works. <laughs> Where was that again? Jai Radha. At least it's good stuff, though. <laughs> If only. Okay, Sri Chaitanya Mano Pishtam Stapitam Nina Bhutale. And Stapitam, as Manisha was telling us, he's established something. This is very important. He's established where? Bhutale, in this material world. The, the, the idea behind how to serve Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because he knows his mind. And heart. Swayam rupa kadahmayam dadati swapadanti kam. So we offer our obeisances into the lotus feet of Srila Goswami and remember that we're following in his footsteps. We're rupa nugas. To, to, to that end, who could say what would be one of the very direct ways that one could worship Rupa Goswami and learn how to follow in his footsteps? Yes. Okay, but uh, you only get partial credit or no credit because the microphone wasn't on. We may have to hire a, a, an IT person this morning. Cause Green microphone, please. Okay. Um, chanting of the Ma Mantra. Why did you say that? Um, because, um, like, no matter, um, well, like, Krishna doesn't see... Um, you don't need to have any qualifications to chant as long as you're chanting with love and devotion. But how does that connect to following Rupa Goswami? Because um, Rupa Goswami was um, chanting 24 hours a day, and I think, no, I know that. <laughs> okay, Rupa Goswami was chanting 24 hours a day, and um, by chanting, you can slowly develop that service attitude. Connect it to something that Rupa Goswami said about the holy name. Where does he say something about the holy name, Rupa Goswami? Mm. You can call a friend. Uh, we have a we have a ringer in the back. Okay, they're suggesting that you say Namashtakam. So say that. Say Namashtakam. In the microphone. Say namashtakam. And the answer is namashtakam. Namashtakam. Uh, how do we know that's true? Because. Because you heard it from Sri Vaspanda. Yes. <laughs> and this f we find in the Srimad Bhagavatam, seventh canto. When the, the demons, the, the, the demigods rather, came to take away Kayadu, who is the wife of Hirani Kashipu, they had speculated that because Hiranyakashipu is the biggest demon of all times, well, wait till his son comes out, and then the whole universe is really going to be in trouble. So they were trying to do damage control. So they came and they stole away the wife of, of Hiranyakashipu while he was off doing some more austerities. And as they were taking her away with the intention that they would keep her until she gave birth and they would kill the child. And who intervened? Yeah, Narada Muni intervened and he told the demigods that actually you don't know it, but there's a great soul within the womb of Kayadu. And here Prabhupada gives the example of the Parampara because then the demigods, and this is why they are demigods, they simply accepted what he said. What, and, and they said, okay, if Narada said it, it's good. So here at ISV, if Srivas Pandit Prabhu says it, <laughs> we accept it. But then we might want to look up Namashtakam. And did you find something from Namashtakam? If not, uh, somebody can bring you a copy because we have over here. So, well, look, he, Srivas Pandit Prabhu, he delivers on all levels. And everyone should have such enthusiasm for Shastra that you keep it somewhere near you so that you can always find it and reproduce it, because it should be your joy in life to be able to find the connection between one thing and another and continue following the thread throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout your life. So tell us one verse from the Namashtakam and tell us why it's relevant. Um. I'll just help you, because 
it's relevant because Rupa Goswami spoke it, and that's how you're trying to connect. So just tell us one verse from that Namashtakam, because we're trying to see why it's important to chant Hare Krishna. Uh, the second verse. Uh, second verse? No, the second verse. So say it definitively and authoritatively. Why say it as a question mark at the end? If you're the making second. a statement, don't put a question mark at the end like the second verse. Just say the second verse, and here's why. Uh, the like second that. verse, because the translation says, Oh Harinam, all glories to you, sung by all the sages. You are the supreme combination of syllables, and you bring transcendental bliss to everyone. If a person utters you but once, even dis disrespectfully, still you will leave his many extreme sufferings. And who wrote that? Uh, Srila Rupa Goswami. Okay, that's a good connection, right? So that's some way you could back it up and say, this is, this is why Rupa, I, I, I'm asserting that Rupa Goswami, by chanting Hare Krishna, I'm following Rupa Goswami. And here's why. It's in the Namashtakam. And here's the second verse. And you quote it, right? Good. Okay, so any other points? Yes. We have a verse from Sri Vatsa. Tell us what you're proving and then give the verse, please. Uh, I was, I was going to prove the um, Guru Maharaj uh, educates the disciple in their relationship with Krishna. That's very important. Go ahead. So, um, there's Srimad Bhagavatam 11.2.37. Fear arises when the living entity misidentifies himself as the, as the material 11.2.7. Point thirty-seven. Point thirty-seven. Eleven point two. Point thirty-seven. Everyone, please say. Eleven point two. Point thirty-seven. So, if on your way home today, you're getting a tattoo. You can put that on your arm. <laughs> Go ahead. See, that's why you need the tattoo. Go ahead. Um, fear arises when a living entity misidentifies himself as the material body because of, of absorption in external illusory, in the external illusory energy of the Lord. When the living entity thus turns away from the Supreme Lord, he also forgets his own constitutional position as a servant of the Lord. This bewildering, fearful condition is affected by the potency for illusion called Maya. Therefore, an intelligent person should engage unflinchingly in the unalloyed devotional service of the Lord under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, whom he should accept as the worshipable deity <coughs> and as his very life and soul. So tell us the thought process. Why did you pick the verse? Uh, <coughs> initially, it was very hard to find this verse because in the index, it was at the bottom. And, uh, so... There are a lot of other um, parts under the section of spiritual master that talked about um, uh, delivering the disciple and other like similar topics such as like what I was looking for, and that referred to um, verses in verses in the Prema Bhakti Chandrika and the Guru Vashtakam. and it wasn't exactly what I was looking for. But then, um, uh, just a sec. Yeah, and then at the bottom there's a. Uh, I just decided to check out uh, one verse that said should accept as worshipable deity, and it happened to be this verse. Okay, so can you say a little bit more about the what realization you have? How this connects to the original point? Uh, it, it. I think it reinforced the idea that um, first of all, when when someone doesn't understand the relationship with Krishna, initially I thought it was like it's just due to simple ignorance, but this verse talks about it as as one of the worst conditions. It's a very fearful condition to live in because uh, it leads to constant suffering, basically. And that can be relieved if one serves the, the spiritual master with the attitude that he's like, he like a deity. Okay, excellent. Let's look at the Sanskrit of the verse. This is an extremely important verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And I'll say the word for word first so we get an idea of what the verse is. I'll say, please repeat, bhayam, fear, tutiya, in something seeming to be other than the Lord. Literally, what does tutiya mean? It says two things. 
So we find it in the word dvija also, right? Dvi. What, what are the dvijas in this world? What are all the twice borns that you know about? There's three of them. There's three altogether. Three dvijas in Sanskrit. Okay, so there's a Brahmin. Why is a Brahmin dvija? Because you're born once from your mother and father and then twice when? When you get diksha, diksha, then that's your second birth. What's another dvija? Shraddha said a bird. And Naveen and Narada Prabhu is showing this Garuda back there. <laughs> so a bird, why is it dvija? First born as an egg and then? Then it's born from the egg. One, two. Dvija. Ja means birth, right? So dvija, two births. And what's the third dvija? Teeth. <laughs> As you get two sets. You're born, first they come out when you're born, and then they all fall out and they come back again. So birds, second initiated, and teeth. These are all dvija. So here, dvitiya means in something seeming to be other than the Lord. So what does that mean? What, philosophically, what is, the, what is the second thing that's is, uh, seeming to be other than the Lord? And why does it use the word seeming to be other than the Lord? This is, this is uh, we're following a good uh, philosophical course here. When we hear the word seeming. What does the word seeming mean? It appears to be true, seemingly. Like, a, you're seemingly a nice person. <laughs> you're seemingly rich. You seem to be very sincere. That kind of, uh, we haven't established it yet. We're, we're, you seem that way, it looks like that, but we're not positive that, that you are, it seems that way. So. What is it in something seeming to be other than the Lord? First of all, is it possible that something can be other than the Lord? You're saying, Sukeshri is saying no, so give her the microphone, she'll back up her statement. Prabhu, I was Stand thinking, strong and defend. Actually, I, I, what I was going to say is, something seeming to be other than the Lord, um, you know, you're seeming because you know that, you know that it's wrong. <laughs> you know, in a sense, um, there's nothing that can take the position of the Lord. But you might be in illusion and thinking something has taken the position of the Lord. Is, is that...? I want proof. We want Sanskrit. Please, prove it. Wait, 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 wait. First you do, and if you can't do it, don't bail out so fast, everybody. If you stand strong and wait for Krishna to reveal it in your heart, you're all learned per personalities. You've studied Bhakti Shastri. Some of you, Bhakti Vai Bhav, you know the answer. So just don't freak out and start looking around the room for others. Look within and see if Krishna will reveal it to you. And if not, ask your neighbor. Okay, go ahead. But we just Speak like a pundit. So, <laughs> so this is like um, Krishna mentioning in Bhagavad Gita that all of them are you know, strung in the, as pearls in the thread. So everything is connected. So Ganavika Mataji is helping me. <laughs> she says that it's, it's something, I mean, personally, I, I, I didn't get that point. But to me, I was just thinking that anything... Anyway, that keep going on the Bhagavad Gita verse. That's a strong verse you can stand on. Defend it's it. Bhagavad Gita 7.6. Etad yonini bhutani sarvaniti upadharaya aham krishnasya jagataha prabhava pralayastatha. All created beings have their source in these two natures. Of that is material and that is spiritual in this world. Know for certain that I am both the origin and the dissolution. Very good. Now let's look at the verse she's quoted. All created beings have their source in these two natures. There's dvitya. Of all that is material and all that is spiritual. Know for certain that I am both the origin and dissolution. That's a very good verse. That's right on, top, right on the money for, for, for helping prove the case. Now, now defend it. There's nothing that can exist without 
Krishna. <laughs> and that you can quote this and defend it very strongly, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So there's nothing like you cannot seemingly think of something else other than when you're talking about Krishna. You can seemingly think of something else. That's the point. There's only one thing that you you might it might seem like there's two things. That's our point, isn't it? So is it talking about the the duality of the material world, where um, you know my understanding is in spiritual world there is no duality. Like you say Krishna, you're actually in touch with Krishna. But so here, here we're so talking about two worlds, two natures, right? What are the two natures? The material and the spiritual nature. Yeah, and uh, wh one of them's Krishna and the other one isn't, right? The other one is also Krishna. Ah, okay. I so mean, it's just tell that us about I, that. I was just thinking about this yesterday. I was thinking that even though you are so much into Krishna consciousness, how is it that you're getting attracted towards things that is material? And then it just dawned on me that even the material nature is Krishna's. It's illusory. I mean, it's not the best thing to happen, but there's nothing away from Krishna. So we are getting attracted to Krishna even in that. But then we have to make a choice that if I get attracted to the illusory energy of Krishna, I will suffer eternally. I cannot so exist without it. Here's the question then. If it's both Krishna, how can one be illusory? And Shredder's going to answer the question because he's been trying to get in here for the last five minutes and I keep skipping over her. You know, I was just smiling because Malini Mataji sent a verse, <laughs> okay, and which has got to do with the illusory energy as well. Uh, so this is from the Chateshwari. Yes, Bhagata. it is. Yeah, two nine two dot nine dot thirty four. This is again. This is a good thread because this is right on the money. This is perfect Bhagavad Gita verse and perfect Srimad Bhagavatam verse to tie this whole uh, philosophical concept into a nice bundle. Go ahead. Translation is, O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Okay, now you uh, propound on this first. Expound, I should say. Yeah, so uh, I was just going to connect it with the word seemingly. Yes, that you know, do. that's something you're, you're thinking that this is what it is, but here Krishna is point blank saying that you know if there if you're if there's anything that is that you are seemingly thinking that's not connected to me has got no reality at all. Give so a uh, give a an analogy that we can all relate to in a way that we've seen something we thought it was something else, but it wasn't. I mean. And one example that, that is always given is of the reflection that we see of of anything like the sun on the water. So it's, it's okay, I'm idea. thinking of one that makes you jump. Naveen and Nirita Prabhu's got it. <laughs> He's making sign language from back there <laughs> without the mic. He's going like this. What is this? <laughs> it's a bird, yeah. Okay, what is this? Is a snake. Yeah. That's oh, not a very oh, good oh. one, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes it's not a very good snake. I got to work on that. Okay. You can mistake a rope to be a snake like that. Is tell that us, that tell us a scenario. Paint a picture. You're walking home at night. Well, I was just going to st quote from the story of Bilva Mangal Thakur. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, actually, it was a snake, and he thought it was a rope, and he it was dangling from his uh, girlfriend's home, and he wanted to badly meet her. Okay. So he thinks that it's a rope, and he climbs it. All right. And then she, when she asked that, you know, how could you come up? The doors were all locked. He said, but didn't you let down the rope for me? He says, which rope? <laughs> and then they go outside to see, and it was actually a snake there. So okay. So that's and the illusion. That and then there's there. also, you're walking home, and on your porch, your porch at yeah. night, before you turn on the lights, you jump, because you saw a snake, right? Yes. But when you turn on the light, you find out that it was a what? <laughs> yes. Correct. Rope, snake, they look the same yeah. so, uh, when there's darkness. But when you turn on the light, you find out that the so-called the seeming snake was a rope. So this is how one might think uh, seemingly 
that the material world is different from the spiritual world. Okay, Hans Priya was, about um, 10 minutes ago was trying to get in, so right after your next point, she'll make hers. No, I was just saying that I was going to, uh, I was thinking of an all encompassing verse, which is the first one from Brahma Samhita. Yes. Which is, uh, it's in the end, it says, Sarva Karana Karanam. So for every cause is Krishna. So how can anything be different? From That's a very important point. And I'm going to read you a verse from the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam that relates to that, that you might find life changing in a positive way. So if you don't want your life changed in a positive way, please cover your ears or go out of the room. This is from a... Sorry about that. Yes. A ten eight forty one. Ten eight forty one. Yes, okay. This is from the pastime of Mother Yashoda and Baby Krishna. So Krishna decides, to, well he didn't decide, he just opened his mouth and so happened when Yashoda looked within his mouth she saw what? Everything. And it was an amazing sight. So then she was a little amazed at that but then she came back to her vision that Krishna is just my little baby. And here's the verse. Therefore, let me surrender unto that, into the Supreme Personality of Godhead and offer my obeisances unto him who is beyond the conception of human speculation, the mind, activities, words, and arguments, who is the original cause of this cosmic manifestation, by whom the entire cosmos is maintained, and by whom we can conceive of its existence. Let me simply offer my obeisances, for he is beyond my contemplation speculation and meditation. He is beyond all of my material activities. Here's Srila Prabhupada's purport. One simply has to realize the greatness of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should not try to understand him by any material means, subtle or gross. Mother Yashoda, being a simple woman, could not find out the real cause of the vision. Therefore, out of material affection, maternal affection, rather. She simply offered obeisances unto the Supreme Lord to protect her child. She could do nothing but offer obeisances to the Lord. It is said, Achintu kalu ye bhava, Achintu kalu ye bhava, na tams tarakina yojayat. Everyone say this verse, it's very important and a nice shloka to remember. You can jot it down and, and uh, pick it up later. Echintya kalu ye bhava na tams tarkena yojaya. Tarkena means to argue. So don't be a tarki. That's from the Mahabharata, Bhishma Parva. One should not try to understand the supreme cause by argument or reasoning when we are beset by some problem for which we can find no reason. There is no alternative than to surrender to the Supreme Lord and offer him our respectful obeisances. Then our position will be secure. This was the means adopted in this instance also by Mother Yashoda. Whatever happens, the original cause is the Supreme Personality of God. It's Sarvakara Nakaranam. When the immediate cause cannot be ascertained, let us simply offer obeisances at the lotus feet of the Lord. I'll read that again because herein lies the solution to all problems in life. And this is the spontaneous path of devotional service. And this is, when we are beset by some problem by which we can find no reason, there is no alternative than to surrender to the Supreme Lord and offer him our respectful obeisances. Then our position will be secure. This was the means adopted in this instance also by Mother Yashodha. Whatever happens, the original cause is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sarvakaranakaranam. When the immediate cause cannot be ascertained, 
Let us simply offer our obeisances at the lotus feet of the Lord. Does everyone agree to do that? Yes. Promise? Promise? From now on. Okay. We made a pact right here in front of the deities, all of us, and anybody online too. <laughs> Mother Yashoda concluded that the wonderful things that she saw within the mouth of her child were due to him although she could not clearly ascertain the cause. Therefore, when a devotee cannot ascertain the cause of suffering, he concludes, Tatinu kampam susamikshamano bunjana eva makritam vipakam ridvagva purvir vidatandamaste jiveta yo mukti pade sadaya bhak. The devotee accepts that it is due to his own past misdeeds that the Supreme Personality of God has caused him some small amount of suffering. Thus he offers obeisances to the Lord again and again. Such a devotee is called Muktipade Sadaya Bhak. That is, he is guaranteed his liberation from this material world. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 2.14, together, Matrash Parshashtu Kaunteya Shitoshna Sukatukada Agama Paino Nityas Tamsatiksha Shrabharata. We should know that material suffering due to the material body will come and go. Therefore, we must tolerate the suffering and proceed with discharging our duty as ordained by our spiritual master. Did we get your point yet? Okay. All right, so this is all going to this very important point, back to Sukeshwari, please, that there's this idea of dvitiya. When I see separateness, and the verse that, uh, that uh, was so astutely brought to us here today by Sri Vatsa was, Bhayam dvitiya abhini beishita syad ishad apeta se vipalya yosmiti the problem is summarized here. What is my problem? That is, bhayam syat. Syat means to arise. So bhayam or fear arises when dvitiya, when I see something separate from the Supreme Lord. I receive suffering, and I think it's coming from some other cause other than my existential position in connection to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And when one identifies everything that's happening to us as coming back to uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and my relationship with Him, or the lack thereof, then I begin to come towards truth. Bhayam dvitiya abhini beishita syad, ishad means God. Ishad means the Supreme Consoler. Where else do you hear isha? Loud. Yeah, so Isha, the Isha Upanishad, is talking about Isha, who's the Supreme Personality of God. Isha Apetasya. If you're in opposition to Isha, the Supreme Personality of God, or the Supreme Controller, Apetasya, you turn around the other way and say, there is no God. Or I'm God, or we're all gods. There are a lot of people, they have different philosophies. Some people say that um, there is no boss. That means like uh, there's no God. There's no, no real person in control. Uh, whatever way you want to uh, interpret reality, that's fine. Postmodernism and any interpretation is as good as another because there ultimately is no supreme absolute truth. And then somebody else will say, well, uh, you become the boss. And then the devotees say, Krishna's the boss. So, ishad apetasya vipari yosmiti, when you get in, in a position where you think there's no boss, or I'm the boss, then you're in trouble. You're in a, a reverse position because actually we're servant of Isha. And so, ishad apetasya vipari yo, vipari yosmiti means, vipari yosmiti means your intelligence is wrong. It's in the wrong position. And therefore, everything you see and do in this world is going to be wrong also. You have the wrong equation. So how to turn it around? Tanmaya, 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 buddhayat abhajatam. So now turn around the other direction. Turn your attitude around. 
Vakyaika Yesham. Eka Yesham means that uh, be one pointed and understand that I'm going to worship Krishna and the spiritual master who's a representative of Krishna. And then you're perfectly aligned and your problem's finished. It's a very si simple equation, it's algebraic. So this is the solution. And finishing, I already finished uh, this verse. So, yes. Hare Krishna. So I, the question that I have is, um, we can have this, this thought that's reoccurring where, okay, this is a, a product of, I have to, I have to continue to, or there's going to be this pattern that continues to happen. And it's like this, this whatever it is that we have to learn, that it's like, um, it feels like Krishna is consistently bringing up the same things over and over again for us to learn how to respond to it. So the question is, how do we get past this feeling of like, oh, I deserve this. Deserve what? I deserve to, whatever the suffering is, like, oh, it's a, this, this is like a deserving feeling and feeling like complacent with it. It's like, okay, this is a reaction, so I have to surrender where is that like that sweet spot of I have to surrender in a, this loving devotion as opposed to surrender and be complacent and just kind of lay there and just let it happen because obviously I I don't know uh, for me it's when it hurts enough <laughs> then I, and it, it's I I've I've when I've suffered sufficiently and I just say no loss I, I give up I I don't I can't handle this anymore. There's a way in which I, I might respond by thinking about surrender because of having good association previously. There is, uh, there are philosophies in the world, for instance, there's a philosophy called Stoicism in which people conceptualize that we're simply meant to be Stoic against all the miseries of the material world. And Prabhupada points this out Actually, he spoke about that once on a morning walk. Someone told him about the philosophy of Stoicism. And then, indirectly, he talks about it when he mentions that the material world, Janmamrit Yujaravyadhi Dukkha Doshana Darshanam, and how um, Dukkha Lahaya Mashashvatam, the material world's a place of suffering, and is also a Shashvatam. So Prabhupada says that someone may then say, well, okay, I don't mind the miseries. Somehow or other, I'll to tolerate them, and I'll just... I'll just stay in the material world. But then Prabhupada says, a shashvatam. You can't even do that because <laughs> it's temporary. It'll, it'll, the situation will change. And one has to, uh, it's not necessarily intellectual exercise. There are a lot of plenty of self-help people out there who talk about ways in which to adjust to suffering. It's not what happens to you, it's about what you do when something happens to you. This is common fare in the self-help market. In fact, this is the main mantra of self-help. That means it's not what happens to you that matters, because the same things happen to everybody. It's what you do about what happens to you that matters. But this may be fall short of this feeling of, okay, now I'm going to surrender to Krishna. And Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita. Bahunam janmanamante gyanavam nam prapadyate. Vasudeva Sarvaniti Samahatma Sadurlabha. After many, many births and deaths, one becomes a jnani, becomes intelligent to understand that this isn't right. And then uh, somebody who's really mature comes to the point of saying, okay, now I'm going to surrender to Vasudeva. Vasudeva Sarvaniti, that's where I'm going to put everything. Bhaktyaika Yesha, I'm going to Devatatma. I put my wound, I put everything into focus on serving Vasudeva. How does one come to that position? Uh, it's a, a culmination of one's many inst uh, <coughs> one's experience of suffering in the material world over a long period of time, plus the good association of devotees who plant a seed of bhakti in the heart, where one then turns to Krishna when one. Uh, is suffering. Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita. Chaturvida bhajante nam jana sukritina arjuna arto jignasa artarti jnanicha bharatarshapa. He says there are four kinds of pious people. 
First he names the impious people. They're people that, as they say in Japan, amidst the suffering, you gone on. Say gone on. Gone on. That means you just keep going. No matter what. <laughs> That's one of the mantras in Japan, gone on. Because uh, they're very gone on focused in, in Japan. They're very determined. They've built a, an amazingly uh, efficient materialistic society there by gone on. So before I have this good association of devotees, as I'm suffering in the material world, I may decide to gone on. Come on, help me out here. Yeah. But afterwards, uh, when one gets some sukriti, that means uh, by association of devotees, then chatur vidha bhajanti mam jana sukriti mar jana, someone has sukriti in their heart. Then when these sufferings ca- come, uh, one then thinks, let me turn to Krishna, let me surrender to Krishna. So suffering in the material world, which is inevitable, plus the association of Vaishnavas, who give us the seed of devotional service, which really comes, as Prabhupada says in the Chaitanya Charamrita, through some instruction. We get the, the proper instruction from a guru that uh, this is how, how you should conduct yourself. And that gets implanted in the heart. Then I have that idea by that association hearing that now I'll turn towards Krishna and I'll surrender. But for a devotee, that becomes more and more subtle so that at every moment the devotee is surrendering to Krishna and turning towards him for, for everything. And that state of dependence is reality because we are dependent on Krishna. And when I think I'm independent, that's when I experience this reversed mentality that I can solve it myself or it's coming from somewhere else, I'm a victim. I didn't cause it myself. So the the refinement of devotional service means to come to see that Krishna is maintaining my life and he is also my best friend, Suridam Sarvabhutanam. He's there as the witness of my activities and he's also my well-wisher in every way. And by the way, he's the only one who can really do anything about it. No one else is your friend. They may say, I'm your friend, you get a common cold, everyone will come up to you and say, hey, let me tell you what to do now. But Krishna, he can actually solve our problems. So that kind of awareness, Vasudeva Sarvami, Krishna is my everything. He's not just a thing, he's the thing. There are many people who say, oh, Krishna is a thing. We don't think like that. Vasudeva Sarvamiti, we say Krishna is the thing. He's the only thing. People say you're fanatical. As we say, fine. You go about your business here in the material world, we're out of here. We're going we're going we're going to the Dham and take shelter of Krishna and we're gonna we're gonna keep on doing that because that's our realization by the mercy of the Parampara, by the mercy of the association of, of devotees. We've come to this conclusion, just as Mother Yashoda, she's surrendering to Krishna. This is the only solution. Just, okay, it's Krishna. Okay, so we didn't finish uh, Sri Vatsa's verse. And that's not it. Okay, we're on the word for word. We just did Dvitiya. Abhini Beshita. Because of absorption. So this is an important word that comes up in the Madhurya Kadambani and elsewhere. Abhini Beshita means to be absorbed in something. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Nahi kashit shunamapi jatu tishchak jakarma krit karete karma sarva prakriti jayagunai. Everyone's always absorbed somehow or other. We're, we're, by nature, because we're cognitive beings, cognition means we're connected everywhere through our consciousness. We're grabbing onto things, in fact, in the material world through our cognition. And we're always absorbed somewhere. And the idea of being absorbed in the material nature, called abhinibeshita, I'm absorbed in thoughts of lording it over whatever I see. I see something, that's why people put things in windows when you go shopping. Because they know, you're going to look at it and they go like, hey, 
I think I should have that. And then he's like, okay, I have to exchange my hard-earned money to buy it now. And whatever we look at in the material world, we get attracted to, we get caught on it. And Krishna says in the, in the Gita that uh, whatever you contemplate, whatever you meditate upon, you develop a sangha with it, a connection. And you become absorbed in it. Now, I get absorbed in the same way as I do in a purse. I get absorbed in this body. I think I'm a man. Somebody else thinks I'm a woman. Somebody else thinks I'm an American. Somebody else thinks I'm Swiss. I'm Indian. Um, and somebody else thinks I'm a cat. I'm a dog. And this is the absorption in the material world, in the material body, a binibeshita. And uh, cats, they sit there all day doing cat stuff. Rabbits? They can only do rabbit things because they're absorbed in rabbitness. <laughs> and human beings, unless they're trained to understand their eternal nature as being separate from the body and connected to the supreme source of our life, Krishna, they think that I'm, I'm a human being and that can be anything because human beings are malleable. They're subject to their environment. In fact, this morning I was just talking to Mukharavinda Prabhu on the way over here about the history of Japan. If you look at the history of Japan, you'll find, and this is true of any place, but particularly it's interesting with Japan because there's an isolated little island there, mostly mountains. And watch the changes that the, the population has been through over the ages due to cultural influence. Portuguese came, the Americans came for trade, and then uh, interaction through war, interaction through one emperor going to another country, then coming back and then bringing a, a new language and, and modifying the language they have. Everything people do and think in that country now has come from some kind of influence. And in the same way, our lives, which are little islands unto themselves, are influenced by the outside world and people interjecting into our lives and so forth. And then we become absorbed in a certain way. We think this is the way it is. Some people wear hats uh, that have, make a, a declarative statement on it, and they think, this, I'll die for this hat. And other people, they raise a flag, and they say, this flag is everything. And this is uh, an idea introduced to them. They came into the world, and someone said, little schnicky, you sit here, now you're an American. You put your hand on your heart, and schnicky, you say, the... The Pledge of Allegiance. I, have to, I used to have to say that when I was in school. That's one of the reasons I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the public which it stands, one nation under God. I can't remember the rest. Uh, oh, you still say it? Oh my God. We got to spring you out of there. Okay. So, Avini Beshita, I get absorbed then and I think I'm an American. And then, mm, sweet land of liberty. And I sing the song. In India, if they sing the national anthem, tears will come to the eyes. And in Canada, oh, Canada. And if you go to Lehigh uh, U uh, University, like, Lehigh will shine tonight, Lehigh will shine. When the sun goes down, the moon comes up, Lehigh will shine. That's their fight song. Uh, and, uh, you know, they think, I'm from Lehigh. Lehigh, uh, the exalted uh, school of intellectuals. And they identify a binibesha. They become absorbed in it. And everyone's absorbed in, in one way or another. So this causes a problem. Uh, from that absorption, siat, it will arise. What will arise? Bayam, fear. Because it's not our nature. It's something artificial. I'm projecting on a screen and I'm identifying with the screen uh, some situation. I'm also measuring the world and I'm thinking I'm going to conquer the world by measuring it. But what's more important, uh, the measured or the measurer? The person who actually can measure the whole world is the one who created it, is Krishna. So everyone's absorbed in some kind of activity in the material nature and identifying with it in a bini beshita, and because of that, fear arises. So now here's the, the solution comes up in the, in the next words. Are you ready? Yes. Ishat, Ishat. From the Supreme Lord. Lord. Apitasya. For one who has turned away. away. Viparyaya. Misidentification 
asmiti, forgetfulness. So smriti means to remember something or to be properly aligned in your intelligence. And asmiti means your intelligence gets disaligned from the idea of ishat being the controller and the source of everything. Tut, of the Lord. Mayaya, by the illusory energy. Atta, therefore. Buddha, an intelligent person. Abhijayat, should worship fully. Tam, him. Bhaktiya, with devotion. Ekaya, unalloyed. Ekaya, unalloyed. Ekaya, unalloyed. Now someone please give me the definition that we follow of unalloyed devotional service. Okay, two hands went up from scholars. Three, four. Let's give it to Mayapur. I know you all know it, so that's because your hand, your hand went up. When you ask this question, everybody's hand should, uh, even if I approach you at one o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping and I ask this question, your hand should go like that. You should know this so, so deeply. For, because you should know these foundational verses, the definition of what we're doing. Otherwise, at some point you'll think, well, maybe uh, some other kind of activity in the material world is equally good. Uh, unless you know uh, uh, what it means to practice bhakti from a deeply philosophical level. So, Please. Anya bilashi dashunyam jnana karma dhyana vritam anugulena krishna nushilinam bhakti uttamam So that was what I was thinking. Okay, that is uh, the Sanskrit for which you get um, 15 points out of 20. Now please expound and tell us what it means and and also give a little commentary. Okay, this is, you know, the definition of devotional service. I mean, devotional service, anya bilashita shunim, not having any other material desires and uh, not depending on jnana or karma but uh, just serving Krishna favorably. Uh, that is the Bhakti Uttamam. That is the highest devotional service. Very well. 19.5 points. <laughs> who, who wants to say more about the verse? Naveena Prabhu, let's ask him to use his Bhakti Vedanta degree to expound a little bit more. And you have to bring the mic, otherwise he'll use sign language. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So Rupa Goswami is giving the clear definition and Prabhupada cites it countless times in his purports. It comes back to this verse that even though karma and jnana, there's nothing wrong with action and there's nothing wrong with knowledge if they're proper action and proper knowledge. But bhakti is not dependent on them. Bhakti is independent of any full of activity or any type of knowledge that's out there because bhakti is only dependent on bhakti. So, Rupa Goswami has stated this to make the point very clear that no one should try to propound philosophies of, oh, just be good, do good, or uh, you just learn a lot of things you know a lot of things, and then that will equate bhakti. That will be equally as important as bhakti. But we see in our history of Vaishnavism that there are many acharyas and many pure devotees who are seemingly not doing much from an external point of view, as far as achieving great things in the world go, or not even, maybe not even literate. But they were honored as great pure devotees by Lord Chaitanya himself, who gave that credit to that seemingly illiterate Brahmin in South India, who, who was simply crying, looking at the at the picture of Parthasari, Krishna driving the chariot of Arjuna, but he couldn't properly read. So this is proving Rupa Goswami's verse that pure devotion is not 
dependent on or paralleled or is supported by karma and jnana, but it is actually the source of all these qualities. Thank you very much, Naveen and Nirda Prabhu. That was a, a, an important anecdote that, Bhakti, that Shaitanya Mahaprabhu would find that those who were engaged in pure bhakti, even though they may not be literate, were practicing that which is completely perfect. And we, we'll take a little bit more. Hare Krishna Prabhu, I, I just had a question Prabhu because you read the word three times, um, I'm annoyed. Um, so I understand, but the thing is, um, you previously What read was it for the premise? What is it that you understand? You, you, I understand that, that our devotional service should be unalloyed and um, it should be devoid of jnana and karma, the desire for fruitive results. But what I, what I find it difficult is that at the previous example you said that when we walk and people put some things on the window we get attracted. But sometimes it seems like the scriptures also do that because um, there is falashruti for everything and uh, then I get attracted towards that because um, so how do we how do we say that then why is why is the shastras do that because then because the soul is already conditioned it seems like they get more con more uh, deeper into material enjoyment by doing devotional service so how they get born to material enjoyment by doing devotional service. With with, uh, with that desire for fruitive activities, like how Prabhupada said, like if you don't come to the level of unalloyed devotional service, you may end up in like some uh, sp some heavenly planet or something like that. Where does he say that? Um, fifth canto. She'll okay. find it. Okay, so. I, I think that it's a, it's a hard thing, like when, when does that happen, that I completely give up this attraction towards material things? Okay, well that's answered in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, Vishayarvini vartante niraharasya dehina rasavarjam rasopyasya param vishva nivartate. In the beginning one may be restraining one's senses, but the taste remains. You're holding back, but it's still the senses are still doing it internally because they're, they're thinking about it and they're still attached to it. There's a connection, which is natural because when we're born, since the Hansa Avatar and the 11th Canto of Bhagavatam, our subtle senses, which then manifest as gross senses, are intimately connected or embedded in the external sense objects. And the external sense objects are embedded within the mind, it's, which is where we're actually experiencing the world. We don't get much here. We actually only get an experience of an experience. <laughs> it's just a reflection on a screen, and then we're trying to enjoy that reflection on the screen. That's the material sense gratification realm. And we're seeing that, and we're attached to it, and as we restrain our senses, the mind is still connected, the senses are still connected subtly. But then, param drishva nivartate, when we taste something higher, when we see it for ourselves, then the lower experience uh, is no longer attractive. This is natural that we, we give up the lower taste because we've experienced something higher. And therefore, uh, until that happens, we may be restraining our senses, but we're experiencing attachment to them at the same time. So there are various stages of devotional service, beginning with shraddha, adau shraddha, tata sadhu sangata bhajana kriya tata nartya, nivriti syatata nishta ruchis tata. And it goes on from there to asakti, then bhava, then prema. And these are the various stages of, of devotional practice. We'll find that at the stages of, for instance, anarta nivriti, we're practicing the rules and regulations of bhakti, not for the sake of following rules and regulations. These rules and regulations come from the Bhagavatam, and they also come from the six Goswamis. So we're not just doing some uh, useless vaidhi bhakti that leads us to Vaikuntha, which is some people uh, have this mistaken idea. 
but actually we're, we're practicing rules and regulations only to, in order to enforce our Raghunuga Bhakti. What kind of spontaneous devotional service are we performing? We're performing a spontaneous devotional service as defined by Jiva Goswami as Ajata Ruchi Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti. So Ajata means our taste hasn't actually awakened yet. But we're still practicing Raghunuga Bhakti before the taste awakens because we're following the rules and regulations given to us from the Bhagavatam and through Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami. These are uh, practices of spontaneous devotional service, although we haven't realized it yet. And before we realize it, uh, uh, we must come through a position, uh, a period of purification. And that means going through anartha navriti, overcoming uh, the five obstacles which are mentioned as the obstacles that block us from nishta, or the practice of steady devotional service, where we're actually fixed because we're starting to experience a taste. Or at least at that point, there's no more obstacles. And those are mentioned as laya, or sleep, vishepa, which means that we're distracted while we do our practice of devotional service. Or we're indifferent to the devotional practice even when there's no sleep and there's no distraction. Or we have innate desires that keep coming out and attracting me to interact with the material world. The last two are very similar. And when, once one comes to this point of nishta, or steady practice to devotional service because of overcoming those five obstacles, then one can then progress to ruchi, where one has a taste, a positive taste. Like if you're pushing a, a, a round rock up a hill, there's a lot of effort that's involved. But once it gets to the top, then you can start rolling it down the other side. So ruchi and asakti means that our mind becomes positively attached. In ruchi, there's a way in which it's easy for us to bring our mind back to the holy name or to topics about Krishna, even though we're engaged in the material world. In, in asakti, it actually becomes hard for us to think about the material world because our mind is so attracted to hearing about Krishna and chanting Krishna's names that in order to pay attention to the work at hand in the material world, we actually forcibly have to bring our mind back to it. And then we, we advance from there. Nonetheless, uh, Vishnu Chakravartyaka points out that although these are presented sequentially, there may be a way in which uh, we experience all of them to some degree or another uh, at various times. And we may get a free sample of uh, something like asakti, where, where we feel inextricably attached to the deity, at least you can't stop thinking about him. And you may have, uh, obviously have, experienced things like this in your life, and they come at different intervals. Now, the position you're taking is, is, is very valid, because actually this is the position that, that Narada Muni took when he talked to uh, Srila Vyasadev, his disciple. And he said, well, you know, why are you presenting all these other things? Because you've presented all these Vedas, even the Mahabharata, and the various Puranas, but you've included all these special incentives in the material world. And uh, you're just going to confuse people. So just tell about Krishna. Because <laughs> he said anything you desire to describe which is different in vision from the Lord will simply act with different names, forms, and results to agitate the mind just the way the wind agitates a boat on the water. And he said just give him the Srimad Bhagavatam. We want to hear the direct pastimes of Lord Krishna. That was Prabhupada's intention also when he came to America. He was saying this is the, this is the cure. So we can do that. And we have, that's what we do. That's our practice. We hear about Krishna. We read uh, the instructions of Krishna from Bhagavad Gita, and then we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam about Krishna. And this will become a panacea. All other uh, forms of support are come from this uh, practice of bhakti. Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janiya Yashavaira Gyam Gyanam Chayara Haitukam. Do you all have verses over here? Because I see you going through all the books and stuff. You're all ready, right? <laughs> I, I think you're preparing some treatise to come out in just a minute. Uh, this verse says that if you practice bhakti, direct bhakti, then naturally you'll get knowledge and detachment from the world. Those things will 
come automatically. And the verse from Prabodhan and the Saraswati, Bhakti Stvayesti Ratayab Bhagavan Yadi Syad Daivina Yat Palati Divya Kishora Muti Mukti Swayam Mukulitanjali Sevate Sman Dharmarta Kama Gataya I blew it, Yataya something. Uh, this verse says that if you practice bhakti, bhakti stvaya stirataya bhagavan yadi just by practicing bhakti, says Prabodhan in the Saraswati, then poetically he says, then mukti comes and stands at your door and says, how can I serve you? Along with dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Where else in the Bhagavad Gita does Krishna say this? It's the last verse in one of the chapters. Vedeshu yagyeshu tapasu chayva Danisha punya palam pratishtam Adyeti tatsava midam vaditva yogi param stanam upaiti chajam He says all these other ideas, uh, studying the Vedas, uh, giving in charity, doing all kinds of pious work and things like that, it's all assumed in bhakti. If you perform bhakti, you'll get everything. Everything will come from that, so don't worry. Did I answer your question, or are we still around the periphery? Yes? Just one more uh, quick follow-up question, Prabhu. Um, so, even in Bhagavatam, for some of the chapters, like if you say Gajendra Moksha, that you won't get bad dreams, and uh, if you say Paritu Maharaj thing, then you will win the battle. So, why is that still in Bhagavatam? Because he said that to... Uh, glorify Supreme Personality. Well, I don't mind those, actually. When we were reading the Pritumar's chapter last year at Govardhan, or n not last year, the year before last, we read the fourth canto, and those were coming out like waves of nectar, and we go, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> I don't mind defeating my enemies at all. Um, but Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that the, the Srimad Bhagavatam is, is just like the incarnation of Mohini Murti. He says this in his commentary near the end, in the 12th, 12th canto, that Mohini Murti, she presented herself uh, in such a way as, as everyone could take from her what they thought they wanted, like the demons they saw, and they saw this beautiful woman, they desired to possess her, and she tricked them. And she said, okay. You know, um, I like you too. <laughs> and they were like, whoa, she likes us. And then she said, oh, you give me the pot of nectar, and whatever I do, you don't mind. Because I can do anything, and you just don't mind. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and then she gave it to the, the demigods. Said, you drink up, you take it, and forget these other losers. And that's what they did. They drank it. And then he says, so... Bhagavatam is like Mohini Murti for the demons, those who have ill motivation, they can't get inside and actually see what the purpose of the Bhagavatam is. They get cheated. And so there's plenty there to cheat the, the, um, those who are ill motivated. Even you can read Rasalila. And in Rasalila, you, you read, what, what does Krishna say to the gopis? Well, just meditate on me. I'm all pervading. Then the the the, the uh, Mayavadis and the impersonalists are going, yeah, we knew it. The Bhagavatam is all about <laughs> impersonalism and uh, Brahmavadism and so forth. Uh, so it's an inside thing. You have to be with a devotee, a pure devotee, to actually understand this and go to the the core of it. And that is the the secret that Krishna teaches in in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Bhagavatam. Okay, and after, Pro, after Sukheshwari, we have more on the internet. I have a question, Prabhu. So I was just thinking that earlier we were discussing that everything that comes from is ca actually coming from Krishna. So um, then how do we deal, uh, how do we think about things that are not the right things, like enviousness or jealousy and things like that? How do we uh, portray it um, as far as the spiritual world is concerned? I think you're asking is, how is it that we make such a misconception even though everything's Krishna? No, my, que my question is like, whatever we have in this material world, is, isn't it right that it has to be there in the spiritual world? But we do hear that there is no enviousness in the spiritual world. 
then uh, why is that existing here? Because that is the root cause of us going away from Krishna. So, you know, even after doing so much of um, devotion... It's there in the spiritual world. It just doesn't have the, the inebriating factor, as Prabhupada uses the word, but it, it means it's not contaminated. Here in the material world, it gets perverted in such a way that it causes us trouble. That's called Hlada Tapachaya, says Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. The, the internal potency of Krishna is known as Hladini Samvit and... What is it? Samvit, Sandini. Sandini? Samvit. Samvit and Hladini. So these three potencies get translated into the material world in the form of the three modes of material nature. And they, instead of bringing us uh, to a higher position of understanding, to sustaining our spiritual existence and giving us bliss, they actually drag us in different uh, ways to, uh, into illusion. So our perception gets uh, skewed because of our association with the three modes of material nature. And the jealousy, there's so much jealousy there in, in the spiritual world, but it's pure. There's so much um, feeling of uh, sadness in the spiritual world, but it's, it's actually edifying. So, another Yashoda, when she loses Krishna to Trinavarta, I mean, this is a, a really scary pastime because, so, Mother Yashoda is carrying Krishna around, which is uh, really one of the most charming pastimes in the Srimad Bhagavatam. I mean, imagine how beautiful Krishna is. I have a picture of him in my room. He has, he's wearing a little uh, tiger's claw around his neck. You know, he's got some ornaments, curly hair. He's beautiful. I mean, babies already usually are, um, I mean, there's a few exceptions I've seen, are, are really like kind of, you look at them and you go like, God, they're really interesting, you know. A little, uh, little, you know, conscious being, but it's in a little baby body. And you try to figure it out. And uh, you can even say they're, they're charming. And you know what to speak of Krishna. He's, he's unlimitedly charming as a little baby. And Mother Yashoda is always carrying him around and just uh, feeding him and thinking about him 24 hours a day. This is total absorption through this rasa. And then one day when she's carrying him, she feels him to be as heavy as a mountain. And then she puts him down. And then just after that, and this is the precursor to Trinavarta, he's a, a demon who's uh, sent by Kamsa to come and kill all the children and, uh, of course, Kamsa and his minions wanted to wreck everything in Vrindavan anyway, so he comes as this big whirlwind. And uh, it was very scary because she couldn't see Krishna. I mean, you put your child down anyway, and then all of a sudden you're separated in a crowd or something like that. Nothing worse than that, right? Say yes. Yeah. So, Shiva is listening. So then, <laughs> so then she puts him down and you know, this dust storm takes over. Nobody can see anything. And then the next thing they know, after complete anxiety of being separated from their cows and the, the village is gone and Krishna is gone, and she looks up and there's Krishna riding on this demon. And he starts uh, assuming the weight of a mountain and he grabs onto the, the neck of Trinavarta, who's trying to get free from him, but he can't. And he's starting to think, well, this... It's a pretty wonderful little kid here. And he comes smashing to the ground, and Krishna's on top of him, and then he appears, and there it is. Krishna's saved, and everything goes on. So... Aren't these pastimes uh, only in the Bhauma Leela Prabhu? In, this, in the Goloka Vrindavan, there is no demon, right? Y yeah, the, the, they're aware of, of demons. They may not be there in the way that they're there in Gokula Vrindavan, but the, the sentiment and feeling is there. Like you'll find in the Brihat Bhagavatam Rita when, when Gopal Kumar goes back to Godhead and he meets Krishna after so long being separated. And Krishna comes, he runs ahead. As Krishna's coming out of the forest when they meet and he sees his old friend, Saruk, and he comes running and embraces him. And then Krishna faints, because Krishna, uh, as Prabhupada writes in 1.2.17, Srimvatam Svakata Krishna, he desires us to go back to Godhead more than we can desire ourselves. 
So Krishna is the one that's in ecstasy, seeing his devotees come back. That's how happy Krishna is when we when we do devotional service. What to speak if we we surrender and come back to him? And when he he faints upon embracing his devotee, and then all the other uh, devotees are behind him and come running up, but they're in anxiety because they're thinking Kamsa must have sent another message. Is this from Kamsa? This person, have they done something to Krishna? Has this person done something to Krishna? So you can see the mentality is there. This creates the rasa because there's always some kind of tension that something's going to happen. And you'll notice that the, the pastimes happen again and again. They're always happening. And they, they go over and over and over again, and sometimes in different varieties. You'll find sometimes that Krishna, uh, when he... Uh, Kasa, he's a Kaliya, he actually gets on him and bridles him up like a horse and rides him around. And, and unlimited different ways in which he interacts with the various demons. And uh, Yes, okay, now we have, we have some major research project that's been going on over here. Please tell us. So previously we were talking about the word unalloyed, so that reminded me of this verse from the first canto, second chapter. Um, so it talks about how uh, the dharma for like everyone is that all men, can, all men and women can attain to loving devotional service. And it says that in order to completely satisfy the self, this devotional service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted. So that aligns with being unalloyed as well. Yes, very good. Excellent citation. Bravo. That's a very important verse because in teaching Krishna consciousness anywhere in the world, you'll find people ask this question frequently, oh, what is the difference between Krishna consciousness and other religions in the world? And an important way to answer that, I find, is to present what is the actual gold standard of any religious process? And that is stated in this verse, to have unalloyed, unmotivated, uh, an, an uninterrupted service to, to the Lord. And it doesn't matter what religious tradition you come from. Um, if that quality is there of unalloyed and, and uninterrupted service, then you have what the Bhagavatam says is the standard for service to God anywhere. And if that appears somewhere, then, then we respect it. We appreciate it. You have more. Go ahead. Um, earlier we were talking about um, how um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is um, Radharani and Krishna, well Krishna himself. So for that verse, um, in, in, in um, Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, it says, The loving affairs of Sri Radha and Krishna are transcendental manifestations of the Lord's internal pleasure-giving potency. Although Radha and Krishna are now one in their identity, they separated themselves eternally. Now these two transcendental identities have again united in the form of Sri Krishna Chaitanya. I bow down to him who has manifested himself with the sentiment and complexion of Srimati Radharani, although he is Krishna himself. So... Very good. Can you please quote the Sanskrit? Um, the Sanskrit. Radha Krishna Pramaya Vikti Haladi Shakti Vashmat Ekta Munav Apibhavi Puyade Bodham Gatthavta Chaitam Yakham Paktam Adhura Tadhavyam Shakyam Aptam Radha Bhavadiyati Shivali Tamami Krishna Sarupam Pretty good. Pretty good. Very well done. Hare Krishna. Are you all studying those? Did Balaram print them out? Yeah. And you're all studying those verses? Okay. It's important to, to um, memorize these uh, f first, I think, just 21 verses altogether the first 21 verses of the Sri Chaitanya Charita. You can just recite them every day, and then you'll um, have the essence of the Sri Chaitanya Charita. So can everyone please do that? Yes. Please say yes. yes. It's what? Yes. Actually, I'll tell you a secret about long and short verses. It's actually easier sometimes to learn long verses. But Sanskrit's not hard to, to memorize because it's, uh, 
it has a metric system. English is very hard to memorize because you have to walk back and forth and pound it into your brain and then make association with various ideas to remember it. But because Sanskrit is metrically perfect and everything fits per perfectly together by Sunday rules and so forth, uh, you won't have a problem doing it. Okay? Say, Sanskrit is easy to memorize. Say, I can memorize hundreds of verses. And it's not a problem for me. I simply recite them regularly every day. And Lord Krishna within my heart helps me to remember them. I remain faithful to this process of reciting important verses. And I take great happiness in doing so. Go pray, Manande Haribo. So now we'll take a two minute break and uh, you can stand up and talk to somebody that you haven't uh, seen for a little while. Don't talk to your friends that you've seen recently. But tell, them, tell a person that you haven't seen for a while, tell them one of your realizations, and we'll come back here for a grand finale to our program to this morning. Are you ready? Okay, go. Did you find any good realizations from the devotees? You're not revealing them? Yes. Uh, we were talking about fear. Okay, good, but better if you use the mic. Hare Krishna, we were talking about fear, how fear arises uh, because of, well, we were, I forgot why fear arises, but we distinguish between two types of fear. One is the fear, like if I'm sitting in one place for a long time, then I uh, get a very painful feeling in my legs and I'm very scared it will never go away. And that's true with any disease. If you have a disease, you're scared, it will never go away. But this is not the fear that it's talking about in this verse. I think the fear in this verse is more related to, uh, it's a more noble, refined type of fear, fear of the impermanent nature of things, the insubstantiality of things. Okay. I think that uh, the idea that uh, um, this disease won't go away, that kind of fear, could also be related to that idea of the non impermanence of things because I'm always worried that this could be it. There's an idea that as soon as I get a disease, and it's true too, that's another thing. People die all the time, young people who are perfectly healthy, and it could be it at any time. That's a problem in the material world. As Prabhupada writes in the introduction to the, to the Bhagavad Gita, we're being stalked by the tigress of non-existence. And this is a frightening condition. And when disease comes, it is concerning because anything could happen. But th thank you for discussing such a weighty topic. Did anybody else have something else? Yes? Guru Maharaj, um, when, you, when you were talking about how um, Mahani Murthy arrives and um, uh, the, the, the demons just surrender to Mahani Murthy in a certain sense, they just accept whatever she says and does it. I was wondering, uh, when Krishna appeared, there were many who couldn't recognize him. When he, even in the Mahabharata, people couldn't recognize him. And then the, the demons sitting in Devlok, they could not recognize him. So I was wondering, there is such a good chance, like every day morning I sit and I chant the holy names, and I don't recognize him. He's sitting right there. I don't see him. I'm doing it in faith, but I haven't developed the taste. Where... How can I say I would recognize him if nobody can recognize him? Well, it's not that nobody can recognize him. You were just saying that some people can't recognize him. But those who are devotees, Krishna says, Bhakti maam abhijananti yavan yashchatsmi tattvata tattu maam tattvato gyapa vishate taranantaram Those who have bhakti, which you get from devotees, this is a very precious uh, asset. When you get from pure devotees, the idea of pure devotion, it's a seed that gets planted in your heart and you begin to develop shraddha, which means that by practicing bhakti I'll get everything. Then Krishna says, yes, that's true. Bhakti maam abhijana ti yavan yash chasmi tattvata tato maam tattvato gyapa You'll know everything about me and not only vishate taranantaram, you'll enter into my existence, which means you'll, you'll enter into, my, into the life, my life life in the spiritual world. So you'll come to know everything about Krishna. He also says, Maya saktamana parta yogam yunjan marashraya asamshrayam samagramam yatagyasasi tashtrunu. If you just hear about me, Arjuna, 
uh, with, with attention, then you'll come to know everything, material, a world, spiritual world. And so everything's possible by the process of hearing and chanting. So we are basically begging for his mercy to know him. Yeah. Because even Arjuna gets to see him only after he provides the vision. Jagannatha Swami, Nayana Patagami, Bhava to me. Please show yourself to me. We can pray all the time. And Krishna does show himself. And even in the beginning of the Bhagavatam, we find that Shukadeva Goswami is revealing to Prikshit Maharaj, look, see, the, how could you miss it? There's the, there's the mountains. What is that? That's the universal form of the Lord, the bones. There's the trees. And in this way, you start to develop the connection. Everything's Krishna. Even though it's an imaginary form, the, the, it's, it's still part of the body of the Lord because everything's part of him. And when you start to develop this personal vision that everything's part of Krishna, and even the events that happen in my life, these are being directed by Krishna's mercy for me, then you get tate, nukampam, susamikshamana, etc. So the, the life of devotional service is, is real. It actually means to be intimately connected with Krishna. What to speak of the deity? We, we're on a fast track. We're following the, the vaiti given to us from Bhagavatam and from the six Goswamis of Vrindavan. And very, very quickly from following such vaiti uh, that, that supports the, the ajata, ajata ruchi, raganuga, sadhana, bhakti, very quickly devotees in Iskand will develop their spontaneous taste for serving Krishna. Like for serving Radha Krishna, we, we serve Radha Krishna as Lakshmi Narayan because it's under rules and regulations. Radha and Krishna are not worshipped by regulated uh, processes because it's spontaneous love. You just, you're in love with them, so you, at any time, day or night, uh, in the spiritual world, you're bringing Krishna something or thinking how to serve him in a certain way. Here, we're regulated. But by doing that, th th that kind of vaiti supports the Raganuga that we're practicing so that we don't fall out of it. And then gradually we awaken our taste and we come to know Krishna directly. Shraddha. Question. So, Mara, this was a question somebody asked me just yesterday. And that was that when we do devotional deity worship at home, what should be our mood? At, at home, the mood should be that Krishna owns this place. And all the food in here belongs to him. All the boga, that's his boga. This is, these are his cars. Whatever money I have in the bank account, that belongs to him. And this is called the what spirit? What's that spirit called, according to the Sri Shapanishad? Say it in the mic. Yes, it's called the Ishavastya spirit. And the verse related to it, say out loud. See, this is Economics 101. When you go into your economics class at school, they're going to teach you about scarce resources, <laughs> dollar votes, everyone gets a certain number of dollar votes, the law of supply and demand, and all kinds of other statistics and stuff like that. And the, words, the world is all about scarcity. But we teach economics in a different way. We teach the Ishavasa spirit. Everything in the world is controlled and owned by the Lord. And uh, it all belongs to him. That solves all the problems. Okay, uh, Shraddha. Uh, the question was more along the lines of like when we worship Krishna in the temple, he's like, we, our mood is that he's not Krishna, the cowherd boy. So the question was that when we are at home, then our mood should still we be that worship him with Krishna as a coward boy. At home? Remember? Okay. Well, the, the only difference, the main difference, rephrasing, uh, between deity worship in the temple and deity worship at home, according to our padatis and the panchratric system, is that in the temple, Krishna is worshipped as a king. And it means you better be on time. You start right at the, at the time the Arctic starts and you end exactly at the end. It's not that you go like, I'm spontaneous. I come in an hour late. It's, it's all about love. That's, that's not how you worship the deity. Of course, not at home either. But at home, there's a different standard for deity worship because uh, you're there with Krishna. He's kind of part of the family. So he's willing to adapt to your lifestyle. He's so kind. So don't take advantage of it. But the fact is that if you raise kids 
and you're worshiping the deity, and then they're saying, uh, Mommy, I'm hungry, and you say, Sorry, we ought to wait for the next Artik. It's in two hours. You, you starve for now. They'll grow up hating Krishna because they'll think that he's the person that uh, <laughs> i got to wait for before I can eat something. So at home, you know, if you want to offer something now, you can just offer it. They bring it to Krishna and offer it. It's not so strict. You have to wait for each Artik or something like that. And it's also, Krishna understands, you have an ebb and flow to your life. Therefore, at certain times you can offer more service at home. Sometimes you can offer less. Uh, and that's acceptable in, home, in the home worship standard. It can expand or, or contract uh, in order to facilitate your home worship. Does that answer your question? Or was it about the conception of what, who Krishna is or something like that? A cowherd boy? I didn't understand that. No, the coward, coward boy was more like he's my friend and I can take liberties with schedules and things like that. So you answered the question. Um, yeah, well, even at home we should have some sense of, of uh, vaiti before the spontaneous love actually arises. Um, but we get that gradually by the process of hearing and chanting and serving Krishna. Prabhupada gives a very simple example. He said, when you're learning to type, you use the typing book and you refer to it. And when you learn where the fingers go and it becomes automatic and you no longer need the typing book, it just, you just type and it becomes natural. So in a similar way, in the beginning, we follow some rules to support our ajata ruchi, raghunuga sadhana bhakti that we're cultivating. But then gradually, by the support of those rules, gesundheit, we um, then become spontaneous in our approach to Krishna because it actually awakens the taste for worshiping him. And we can't stop thinking about him. And we're thinking all the time, like, i I got to do something more for Krishna. And everything that you see, you're thinking, like, let me bring that to the deity. Let me um, get better flowers. Let, let Krishna would look so nice in this. Or um, like Madhavendra Puri, when he was down in, in Ramuna, and he was watching the deity worship there, he was thinking, oh, I want to, I want to do this for my deity. And then, you know, he asked Bajari, you know, how do you make that? And then he started thinking, God, I just asked a question about the boga. It wasn't even offered yet. And he's, because of his refined sentiments, he began to feel that uh, he was an offender. It wasn't true at all, but he felt like that. And he, he went off into, into the empty marketplace to chant and, and ruminate uh, about his offense. And then Krishna kept back some of the sweet rice for him and then called the Bajari in his dream. The Bajari had a dream. It's a, the deity said, Gopinath said, I've, I've taken some sweet rice from my devotee. So now you take it to him. So the Pujari got up, he took his bath, he came in, and it's like, oh my, this is amazing. Uh, Gopinath's taken this for his devotee. So he went off in the marketplace. Anybody named Madhavendra Puri, please uh, show yourself because you're the most fortunate person in the universe. Gopinath saved this for you. And um, then he, he took that and he honored that sweet rice. And he also kept the little pot. Too bad they don't have those anymore. The little clay pot he kept and he used to take a little bit of that in, in love that Krishna reciprocated my desire. So the devotee's always thinking about Krishna, how to serve him, how, what, you know, what he's wearing. He wants to be there to see when Krishna appears and Janmashtami happens. He's thinking all the time like how to make the festival more grand. This is one of the principles of devotional service, have grand festivals, as nice as the, that you can make them. And invite everybody. Invite the mayor, invite the governor, invite president, I'm not going to say his name, to come. <laughs> And, uh, you know, let him come. And, and everybody should come and feel what, you know, what it's like to, to, for, on Krishna's birthday and all these things. And that this is one of the principles of devotional service. And this is what we've been given. This is the spontaneous path of devotional service that's awakened through practicing the, the rules that come from Srimad Bhagavatam, that come from the six Goswamis and from Narada Muni. Uh, we won't go wrong following those. We'll come to the point of spontaneous devotional service. Uh oh, there's another question. Hi, Krishna. Stuff, right? Right? Thank you for a wonderful yes. class. I have a question. Uh, you said uh, restrain our senses. Uh, we restrain our senses, but uh, mind is attached. Uh, 
but when we find something higher uh, the attachment will uh, lose but uh, so should we restrain our uh, senses or just go with the devotional service and uh, well, the main thing we advocate is to remember Krishna this is the first principle and, you know, we're not going out on Hari Nam last night we didn't sit down and sing about the four regulative principles nor did anybody who came into the Japa tent and sat down and said, listen, there's four regulative principles. <laughs> they would have fled as quickly as possible. Uh, the, what we teach is spontaneous love for Krishna, which is chanting Hare Krishna. You just sing about God and remember him. And from that, you'll naturally, you'll naturally develop a taste uh, for following the principles. That's how Prabhupada started the Krishna consciousness movement. He didn't tell anybody until... It, after they got initiated, <laughs> what the rules were. Um, first, remember Krishna, but he sensed that they were already attached to remembering Krishna. So first thing is, is to remember Krishna, and then it becomes natural. Yes, we should follow regulative principles. Krishna says, Raga dvesha vimukta istu vishayam indrayaishcharam. Atma vasharavati atma prasadam arigachati. If you follow this regulation for me, then you'll get my mercy. A prophet says in a lecture, he said, so Krishna will look at your life. This person has chanted Hare Krishna every day, 16 rounds, for me. This person has tried so hard to follow the four regulated principles for me. This person has dedicated his or her life in my service. Back home, back to Godhead. He notices, you know, that we're trying. Yeah, go ahead. That's the thing. So the regulative principles support our spontaneous devotional service. It's not that we're performing rules and regulations for the sake of rules and regulations. We want to go to Vaikuntha and be very regulated in the way we serve Krishna. No, we're all about what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, which is a spontaneous devotional service and prema ras. But we get there by following Rupa Goswami his rules and regulations, and the rules and regulations of the Bhagavatam. And by following those, our love will be stimulated and it will be awakened. You can't worship Tulsi Devi without becoming joyful. It's impossible. You try it. Try it for a week, singing the Tulsi Devi song, uh, circumventing it, and try not to become joyful. Try to remain morose, depressed. You can't do it. And if you go on worshiping Tulsi Devi, everything that's there in that song, it's a prayer. Please engage me in spontaneous devotional service in Vrindavan, in Vraj. Uh, she'll fulfill your desire. And so will the devotees, because they're desire trees. Vancha, Kolpatarubhishcha, etc. So just some closing advice, and you have something to, to give. Okay. Back to the Pandit Circle. Please expand. So we're talking about Anwar devotional service where I found this Bhagavad Gita verse 10.7. Etam vibhutam yogam cha mama yoveti tatvataha sa vikalpena yogena yujyate natra samshaya. One who is factually convinced of this opulence and mystic power of mind engages in Anwar devotional service. Of this there is no doubt. So it says that... Um, if one is um, convinced that I have, um, I own all the mystic power and all opulence in the material world, he engages. Um, he understands that he, uh, he, uh, Krishna is like the supreme personality of God, and he engages in his unloyal devotional service, understanding that um, only by Krishna uh, he'll um, he'll uh, he'll have happiness, and he understands his position as the servant of Krishna, so he performs unloyal devotional service unto him. It's a very compelling argument and good evidence. Thank you. <laughs> what I took from that is that if we're acquainted with who Krishna actually is, why would we look elsewhere? If somebody understands my mystic opulence, the extent of my mercy, which is unlimited, my friendship, as Krishna, as Prabhupada says, oftentimes Krishna is very friendly. He so he says he's so friendly to the living entity. Take goes with us everywhere. Why would you go anywhere else? And this is a good question to ask one's mind, because as soon as I sit down for japa, the mind says, "Let's go to Kmart." It's like, why go to Kmart? I hate Kmart. But 
He was like anywhere but here. But actually, when we understand, when we're convinced of the beauty and opulence of Krishna, when the mind understands that all beauty is, is there within the holy name. All of Krishna's uh, fascinating pastimes are there. The charm of Krishna is there within the holy name. Why would I go shopping somewhere else? Why would I go to Kmart? Just plastic stuff. And it's, um, it's extremely annoying. Not just annoying. I, nothing against Kmart, but I can't do it anymore. Okay, so I just want to read uh, uh, in the last couple of minutes some advice from the um, Mahabharata. This is um, Fault Finders Take on Others' Karma. From the Mahabharata Udyoga Parva 34.74. The ignorant seek to injure the wise by malice and backbiting. By doing so, the critic takes upon himself the load of the wise man's sins, which he, the wise man, casts off by forgiving the ignorant. <laughs> Dattatreya to the sadhyas in the Mahabharata Udyoga Parva 36.5 one who remains tolerant, not becoming angry, certainly attains the abuser's pious credits. Indeed, his own sins are transferred to that wrathful person. And then Bhishma to Yudhishthir, whoever indulges in praising or criticizing the qualities and behaviors of others will quickly become deviated from his own best interest by his entanglement illusory duties. And finally, we have from the Manu Samhita, quoted by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in the Brahmana and the Vaishnava. Throughout his life, a Brahmana should consider material prestige to be like poison and dishonor to be like a nectar. Shall I read that again? Yes. Throughout his life, a Brahmana should consider material prestige to be like poison and dishonor to be like nectar. After all, if one learns to tolerate dishonor, then his agitation will subside and he, he will happily sleep, happily wake, and happily move about. The person who insults him will, because of his sin, become regretful, and his happiness in this life and the next will be vanquished. Finally, Bhishma to Yudhishthira, Mahabharata, Shantipava 115.11. A person who praises someone in his presence but criticizes him behind his back is no better than a dog. His chances for elevation to higher planets are completely spoiled in this world. Practical advice. So we can try to follow those things very practically. And uh, one lesson from today is to be interested in the, the connections throughout the Shastra. We've been given the, the complete, as complete as we need, Vaishnava canon. means all the scriptures that we need to understand the holistic nature of, of bhakti yoga, how it applies to our life and body, mind, and spirit, and uh, follow the threads. Take these the shloka books and make sure that you find out where something comes from. Take a look at it. It, it won't hurt you. And uh, if you look at it and you follow the thread, you'll start to be uh, enthralled by it and, and see how there's a... Th continuum of thought that goes through the whole Shastra. And when you have that, says Kaviraj Goswami, Siddhanta Bolaya Chitta Nakara Alash, Iha Hoite Krishna Lagi Sudrud Manash. He says that, don't be lazy about this, follow it. And when you do, you'll come to understand Siddhanta. That means very clearly what something is and also what it isn't. And when you have that, then Sudrud Manash, then your mind becomes very fixed in devotional service, that I'm doing this because you're clear about what the goal is, and you're clear about how to get there, and you're clear about the ramifications of deviating from the path of devotional service. You understand the consequences of your actions in this world, and that's what humans all, being a human is all about, right? Say yes. yes. Okay. So, the time went by within about two seconds. If we had a time for retreat where we could spend one week just doing this and nothing else, wouldn't it be nice? Yes. Say yes. yes. Then, dear Lord Krishna, please uh, transport us to, to okay. <laughs>
to your association, wherever you may be. And please keep us engaged in Krishna Kata. Please use, let us use our time on this earth as we're only passing through here with these temporary bodies to hear about you, glorify you, and to expand Sankrita and the chanting of the holy names and book distribution unlimitedly all over the planet so that all the people in the world can take to the same process. Everyone who agrees with this, whether you're in this assembly today or watching online, or you listen to it later on, and you agree with it in part or in whole, <laughs> please say Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna! Go Nitai Gora Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Nitai Gora Hari Bo, Nitai Gora Hari Bo, Bo, Nitai Gora Hari Bo, Vancha Kapa the Rusha, Kripas in the Bay, Vachapa Titan and Pavani, Bio Vaishnavi, Bio Namuna Mahan, and to go to Vaishnavi Nikijai. Marman, not to the arm, Marman, not to the arm, Marman, not to the arm, Marman, hey, not to the arm, Marman, not to the arm, Marman, not to the arm, Marman, not to the arm, Marman.